This has been uh, an exciting teaching series we're in at Jesus is Lord Ministries International. It's entitled, Your True Identity, Who I Am in Jesus Christ, and this is week 51. So we're closing in on one year of learning and knowing who God is, who Jesus is. We're getting ready to transition into the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we're going to open in prayer first. Father, we thank you for this day, this time to gather, to learn about you, for your scripture says that eternal life, to have eternal life, is to know who you are and who Christ Jesus is, and that's what the inspiration is for this class, Lord. So we ask you to bless these words. Let these words that come forth from my mouth be your words. Let them fulfill for your goodwill what you want them to accomplish, and let us leave here this evening changed forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So once again, we're in week 51 of this teaching series. We're going to start to talk about the Holy Spirit. We looked at a review or kind of did a synopsis and a recap of what we've done over the last 49 weeks last week. But this week, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to get into the book of Acts, and I'm going to read and comment on part of chapter 1 because we have to see what is unfolding here before we get into the Holy Spirit. Now, once again, I was in prayer, and I was seeking God, seeking His face, and I kept telling him that I wanted to know him deeper. And the answer to that prayer was he opened a door for me to do this teaching series. Um, so for me to teach about God, I have to learn about God, which is what the prayer was. Uh, but we all, we all have to learn this. It's important. Our salvation has more to do than simply saying a prayer. And um, what we're going to do over the course of the next few weeks is we're going to take a look at and I want to review first in the very beginning of this class when we looked in Genesis and we see in chapter 1 verse 26 and God said the word God is the Hebrew in the Hebrew lexicon is categorized as H430 it's Elohim which is the plural of Elohim. And we see where God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God spoke, the Father spoke the word, and the Holy Spirit hovered and moved on the word of God. So we see the three parts of the Godhead working together. Now, in the book, of, in, in, the, in the Bible, the word God capital G-O-D, in verses. This, this is, is not any time that it's used in a subtitle added to part of the scriptures. In verses itself, by inspiration of God, through the Holy Spirit, that word is used 3,876 times. In the book of Genesis, we see the word 199 verses. Now, I'm going to give you some numbers here uh, just to make and emphasize that the Holy Spirit is real and a person. Uh, some of the numbers that I give you are going to total more than 199 because sometimes that word is used twice in one verse. But it's used 199 ver in 199 verses, and that's the plural. It's where we see the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit together. There's 16 times where it's used in another context for the Hebrew, um, the way the Hebrews considered God as, as their, national, their national God, and then two other times in a different context, and once it's used uh, where it, it shows up as God of Jacob. So the entire book of creation and the very first book in the Bible and in the history is uh, predominantly, by far, we see the plural Elohim used. So the Holy Spirit is important. 
So we can't, when, when we're learning about God, we can't leave the Holy Spirit out. Now, there's some denominations that uh, don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll get into that later on. Um, but God is not a respecter of persons, and he doesn't change. He cannot lie. Uh, and he said, did I not do what I said, or will I not do what I say? I'm paraphrasing there, but... Um, the Holy Spirit is important. So to completely cover God, we're, we're actually in phase three of this teaching. We started out to learn about the Father by names and titles, and then we shifted into the Word and Jesus. And now we're going to get into the Holy Spirit, and we're going to transition after the Holy Spirit to see how they work together. But we need to understand the Holy Spirit first. So the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father, and we're going to see that in the first chapter of Acts. Um, that phrase, with one accord, shows up twice, uh, in the, once in the first chapter and once in the second chapter. So we can see that... Um, in chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. So they were in one place. They were gathered. They were not scattered in lockdown. Uh, and, and we're going to look at verses, I believe it's 1 through 17 tonight in the book of Acts, and look at the backdrop of when the Holy Spirit came, when the, when the promise came upon the disciples, those that were uh, with one accord in the room, and, and what they were doing, which we've already led into when we studied that phrase. Um, and then later on, uh, maybe, if led by the Spirit, but I would encourage you to read verses 14 through 36 where it's the context of it is Peter's Pentecostal sermon. Now, Peter's going to give this sermon. Um, he's, he's, he's being led by the Holy Spirit. Remember, God said, when you go out, uh, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll fill your mouth. So he gives a power. For, there's 120 people gathered in the room, numbered in the room, and 3,000 are going to be added into the body or into the church of God. And I'm going to repeat that. The church of God. Not a denomination. The church of God as was set up in the book of Acts. Um, if you want to understand what it is we're supposed to do as Christians, it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You just have to read the red letter edition of what Jesus says. And the book of Acts is going to start out with a very profound statement by Luke, who's the author of it, and this, this follows the gospel of Luke. So we have, a, we have a Pentecostal sermon where Peter, after he receives the Holy Spirit, preaches, and if you would read those verses, he's he's or the Holy Spirit's criticizing those that killed Christ. He talks about Christ, but he, it's a synopsis. It's a, it's a review of what the gospel is when you go through that. Now, as an outline, over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at who, the Holy, who is the Holy Spirit. We'll look at what are the names and titles for the Holy Spirit or of the Holy Spirit. What symbols does the Holy Spirit use or does the Bible use to describe the Holy Spirit? Uh, types and shadows throughout the Bible of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at the person and work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? If he's working, there must be a role because God is not inconsistent. So we should be able to see by the time we come to a conclusion uh, with this brief, brief study, certainly we're not going to learn everything about the Holy Spirit, but hopefully you get inspired to study who God is, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, because you were created 
in his image to be after his likeness. So we have to understand who God is, what we're supposed to be, and how can we get there. And the Holy Spirit is going to help us, the Spirit of Truth. So we have to also understand and recognize when we're being led by the Holy Spirit. There are certain ways that God will speak to us, that he can guide and lead us through the Holy Spirit, but we have to know what those are so that we can recognize who's speaking to us. Because you can be, you can be spoken to by the Father, by Jesus, the Son, by the Holy Spirit, or a spirit that you don't want to listen to, an unclean spirit or, or a lying spirit, a spirit of the enemy. You have to be able to discern whether it's God or whether it's something else or whether your own, your own imagination, your own flesh. Uh, and if it is God, it's important to understand who actually is speaking to you. Now, before we get into Acts, I want to just kind of whet your appetite a little bit. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, moves in, in our services. We worship God in truth and spirit, and as we do that, as we're worshiping Him through our worship music, you can feel the intensity of of the presence of God increase as we call the Holy Spirit into the service. And then we hear the word. Remember, God's word is the truth, and the spoken word of God uttered by a believer with authority is what the Holy Spirit will move on. So we speak nothing but the word of God, and we preach Jesus Christ here, and then God follows up the service because signs, wonders, and miracles will follow the spoken word of God. If you believe that, it's going to happen. And it happens here week after week after week. Now, as this happens, it can the Spirit of God, the glory of God, can be manifested in many ways. Some people will weep. Some people feel joy. Some people will drop on their knees. Somebody may lay down on their face. Some people may run. Uh, some people might dance. I mean, the Bible says lift holy hands, shout unto the Lord, uh, dance, sing a new song to God. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to dance. I, I, I can't. So I have to wait for the Holy Spirit to hit me and let him move my legs. And then I can trust that nobody's looking at me because they should be paying attention to what's happened to them anyway. <laughs> but two weeks ago... We had uh, several of our ministry staff up at our altar, and at the end of every service, we will call the congregation up. It's not that, that if we need prayer. We all need prayer. Some people need whole, uh, uh, healing. Some people, uh, whatever it is that they have uh, the desire of their heart that lines up with the will of God that we can we can agree with them on, but that is where most of the manifestations of God's glory are going to show up. It could be something as simple of, uh, and I'm, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't know when this all happens. I just know that as I ask God to fill me, the Bible says that freely you have received, now freely give. And the Bible also says that you should be rivers of living water should be coming out of your belly that's the river of life it's the spirit of god so we want to continually get filled with god's spirit so that we can release it and minister to people now the very first time i went to lay hands on somebody and they came under the power of god or slain in the spirit i i wasn't feeling anything i just spent a lot of time in that personal place with God and I'm up at the altar and I stepped towards somebody that I knew they came up and asked me to pray for them and as I did I laid my hands on them and then I began to feel something inside me and I, I knew and I just said the Spirit of God's gonna come upon you 
uh, and in waves, and it, it did. It started to come, and I th they were reacting, uh, and then they they came under the power of God. So there was an instance where there was probably less than one minute in one instance between one person and another where the glory of God hit that person came out of one freely you have received now freely give and and into another now two weeks ago we believe in in uh, in the body ministry within the body of Christ so when people come up for prayer here at Jesus is Lord Ministries they're gonna stay there because somebody could get, could be led by the Spirit of God to go lay hands on them and have a word for them and then somebody else may later on and different things can manifest between different people but somebody had come up to to the altar a few weeks ago I, I never saw this man before but pastor Mike came up to me he had gotten a word of knowledge one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that this man had a calling on his life and he said Pete would you pray for him so I walked up to him so that was the Holy Spirit started with pastor Mike he gave him a word it goes to me I start to pray over this man and he starts to weep and shake I don't remember what I said because what was happening was the Spirit of God was speaking through me uh, and, and I remember there were there were words of knowledge coming out of me but I don't remember what I said uh, but I did I did feel in my heart that the Spirit of God came upon him so I walk away and, 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 and I've learned that as I'm praying for somebody and I'm watching the manifestation of God in them, not to always walk away from them even if I, I, nothing else is coming out of my mouth because the Holy Spirit might not be done for whatever reason. That, that person might be waiting. The Holy Spirit may be doing something inside them in their heart or whatever. I, I don't know, but I'll wait there. Well, nothing happened, and I, I got led to go pray for somebody else. So I walk away to go lay hands on another person, and I don't know who it was, but one of the other, uh, one of the elders, I believe, came behind me and walked up to this gentleman and laid hands on him and started to pray and he came under the power of God and got slain so you had you had different members of the body like the Bible says but one spirit so the same spirit moved pastor Mike to give me a word of knowledge to go start to pray for this gentleman the power of God started to to, to, that river came out of me and started to go into him and then when this when I walked away from him uh, another gentleman got inspired by the spirit to come up to him and then when he laid hands on him uh, th that that came about so you have you have one person one person get a word of knowledge give it to another when I came up to the gentleman, I do remember now, the Holy Spirit just reminded me. That's one of the reasons we need him. What happened was I started to pray for him, and I stopped, and I asked him if he had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he said no. And he started to explain to me that he wanted to be, but he was afraid of it. So I had to take a few minutes to explain what the Holy Spirit was and whatever came out of me uh, eliminated any fear or trepidation in this person and I just looked at him and I said you're gonna start to feel something and you, you're gonna wanna open your mouth and just start to utter because it's the Holy Spirit that gives utterance to us and I couldn't really hear what he was saying he was kinda mumbling and I, I, I just knew in my spirit that he was he was hesitant to speak out loud what he didn't understand which is is a lot of times not uncommon so what I did was I looked at him
put my hand on his shoulder and I said, I'm going to start speaking in a tongue and you just listen to what comes out of my mouth and and try to imitate it and then you don't have to think about it you, ju you just listen to what comes out of me and uh, um, very shortly um, I don't know if there were sentences whatever it was but in a short utterance he he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and then he started to weep and right after that was when he talked to me a bit so he had questions and when he was done with the questions, that's when I walked away. And then the one elder in the church came up to him and laid hands on him, started to speak in, into this man's life. And that's when the, the presence of God hit him, the glory, and he went down. So you had three different people, three different members of the body of Christ get instructed or guided or led by the Holy Spirit in different ways to go to the same person and they receive three different things, all, all from three different people. So we are different members, but there is one spirit. And that's why Paul continually reminds us in his epistles that we need the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So there's a testimony of how the Spirit of God can flow through um, a gathering. A gathering if you were not here and your church isn't open you missed it because you had to gather the Holy Spirit used touched four different people at one at, at shortly one after the other three different people same spirit and then that spirit came upon the fourth one the one that came up uh, wasn't quite sure what they wanted to do to ask for prayer um, I don't know what he was thinking about, but the word of knowledge that was received or given by the Holy Spirit to the first person opened the opportunity when it was given to me to go start to speak about the Holy Spirit. And it's not a coincidence that, that this gentleman, that I was the one that got directed when you think the week before or the week after that was when we were going to transition into the Holy Spirit. So I had just got done spending time with the Holy Spirit that morning in study uh, in my time with God. So uh, there it was. You know, the word that God, God's word is not going to return void. Somebody studies about the Holy Spirit to teach it, and they're the one that God picks to go deliver a word of knowledge to and for them to go speak to this person. So as that's happening to this one individual, there's a group of other people up here with other, other elders and pastors moving to different people. And if you look around, you can see two people maybe are praying over somebody or one person sometimes the spirit of god will move on one person to go to pray for somebody and then you'll watch them move over because they they know somebody or whatever and they're going to go ask for prayer for them it could be uh sometimes i may have a personal prayer request and there's only a couple people that i may mention that to i i, I don't know I, and and we just need to let the Holy Spirit show up and have his way the freedom to do what he wants to do in the service so I hope that testimony kind of shows those two testimonies the both extremes or far ends of how this can work one-on-one -on -one where somebody hardly utters anything and that person comes under the the, the power of God and that person that got uh, slain or came under the power when they were on the floor now they've already been baptized in the Holy Spirit so they were shaking and um, they were speaking in a tongue so the spirit moved on on me I laid hands on them that that person came under the power of God and then the Holy Spirit did whatever he was doing in them as, as he was speaking through him on the floor uh, and then you had four other people in in another circumstance but the point is is you have to allow you have to be able to speak 
the Word of God, and you have to let the Holy Spirit move on the Word of God. You've got to allow enough time. And that happened. Uh, I'm learning that when I'm up at the altar, I don't, I, I, when, I, when I would first meditate on scriptures, I knew God's word wouldn't return void. So somebody would have a prayer request and I would pray the word of God with them and ask them uh, just to stand there in agreement. Uh, sometimes somebody got radically healed. Sometimes it didn't appear anything happened. But what, what I realized was as the spirit guides and leads you, there's times where people have asked me or said something while I'm up at the altar and I don't speak right away. I wait on the Spirit of God. Sometimes it probably feels like an eternity to the person standing there uh, because they may open their eyes, they close their eyes and then open them to look at them to make sure I heard them. But I'm waiting to, to hear and, and maybe meditate a little bit on what they said to me uh, so that I'm sure that I hear their heart. Because uh, sometimes somebody will ask you for prayer and that's really not what they need. You may ask them a question and their explanation may, may, it may be a misunderstanding. They may think that they want one thing, but when there's clarity given, it's something else that they want, and then you, you, that's what you would pray for. Um, but you want the Holy Spirit to be free. And in the Gospel of John, when Nicodemus in chapter 3 goes to visit with Jesus to, to ask some questions, Jesus gives a very good explanation about the Spirit and wind. But we're not going to get into that tonight. But as far as the importance of the Holy Spirit, and when we get into the book of Acts, you have to understand this chapter, this book, is the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus is going to ascend in chapter 1. We're going to take a look at the last words that he says while he's here on earth. Because he gives a command, he gives several commandments, commands, and commandment to them to the disciples and then he leaves uh, so they have a mission uh, but they have to receive the Holy Spirit now why would he why would and you have to remember Jesus said I must be about my father's business so everything that he said and everything that he did was the will of the father and the Holy Spirit is a promise of the Father. So what happens? How does that work? Well, Jesus, we all know who he is or, or have some idea that he's God, a lot of us. But Jesus was baptized in water and then he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he did not start his ministry until after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. So if the Christ, the Son of the living God, was baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and, he, and water for, for um, confession and repentance, as an example, he told John when, when John the Baptist didn't feel worthy to baptize him that they needed to do this to fulfill all righteousness, um, why w wouldn't we... Wouldn't we if we didn't want the Holy Spirit, wouldn't we even have, have some inkling or understanding that if Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit and he did what he did, that we would need that to be able to go do what he, he's going to send us to do? Remember, he said, You're gonna, you could do greater works than I when I leave, but I'm going to send the, the helper is going to come, the promise of the Father. So you need the helper to be able to actually fulfill the calling on your life it's for for the the to guide and lead you but in in all four gospels not always do we have the same message in all four of the gospels but in all three of the synoptic gospels in matthew mark and luke we see the baptism of jesus 
In the Gospel of Matthew, it's in chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. This is where Jesus is baptized. He goes under the water. He comes up. The Holy Spirit comes upon him like a dove. And we hear the, the, the thundering voice of God say, This is my Son, whom I'm well pleased. In Mark chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, we have a shorter version, but the same message. And then in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, Jesus again, it, it, this is the, the recordation, it's recorded in writing in God's holy writ, that Jesus is baptized in water and by the Holy Spirit. He receives the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, verse 29 to 34, the context of those verses, John is... It's John's witness to Jesus. Remember, we are called to be witnesses for Jesus, and John actually starts this off. He's witnessing who Jesus is because he's saying that he knew it would be the one that the, the Holy Spirit came upon. So he's kind of reiterating what happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or what's recorded there, uh, but he's speaking of Jesus and, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the dove, so that he knew who Jesus was. So he's now a witness. He witnesses to him. And at least one, maybe two of the disciples are there uh, that go to Jesus. They're disciples of, of John the Baptist at the time. So the Holy Spirit's important. We see it in all four of the Gospels where Jesus is baptized. Now, I've had people, uh, when I used to teach a, a new believers class at the church that I went to, um, they would receive God's free gift of salvation in that class. Um, so they would believe in their heart. They hear, heard the gospel. They believed it in their heart. They confessed it with their mouth. And then they most of them wanted to be water baptized because it says to do that in the Bible. Now, there were several cases, at least two that I can remember, uh, one very clearly, where there were two individuals, and th this was in individ different classes, that had very traumatic experiences and near-death drownings. So they, were, they had a fear of water. Now, if you are walking in the Spirit, and the more that you look like Jesus, your simple, calm voices, because you can't make anybody do anything. It, it, it just isn't going to work. There's going to be nothing behind it. If I would come up to somebody on the street and say, look, just get over it and say this prayer, that, that's not going to work for them for their salvation. These people, I could tell... And I knew in my heart that they, they had a heart and they would after Jesus. So all I said to them, now they just went through a class that I taught and they were given the word of God. They were given testimonies. And when I was teaching this class, I was, I was on fire for God and, and, you know, I would use the blackboard. I had one at the time. I would use visuals. So they, they could see an excitement in me. So they had an example of somebody that was excited that was following after God. So all I said to these people was, if you would like, I will go up to the baptism with you and I'll help you get in the water. Now, the, the lead pastor was going to do this. Uh, what happened was they, they went up to the baptismal they got in the water, and I started to walk to them, and just those couple simple words uh, relieved their fear, and they did it. So trauma got broken off uh, by Galatians chapter 22 and 23 verses. Against such there is no law, the fruit of the Spirit, which we're going to talk about later. When we behave and exhibit those characteristics or those attributes, that character, nature, and personality of Christ, of God, uh, it does have an effect on people. And I've seen it a lot of times where I've been with angry people, 
their countenance was angry coming out of a store and I'll hold the door open for them and they look at me and they're, they're, they're mad. They want to say something negative and lash out and I'll just say, good morning, ma'am. And that breaks right there. It breaks off. They don't know how to deal with that and they'll just respond nicely to it and say, oh, thank you. Good morning. And it, it just flips like that. But we have to be we can't be fake. We have to be led by God and we have to exhibit those characteristics. So the Holy Spirit's important. And now let's take a look in the book of Acts. Now this is going to include Jesus' last recorded words. And we're going to start with verse 1 and I believe we're going to go through Let's see, maybe we'll go up to 17 if we have time. We've seen this first verse before for different reasons, but this is, this is a follow-up reading. Luke is writing this, and he wrote the gospel according to Luke under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he starts out, the former account I made, so it's a written account, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So he's referring to the gospel of Luke. What did he do? He recorded what Jesus did and what he taught. Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up. So they're talking about it, the ascension. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Remember in the Gospel of John, Jesus prays about the apostles and the disciples that he hasn't lost anybody that the Father had sent to him. So the Father has sent people to him and he was led to choose these people. But it's important to understand what this says. After he, meaning Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, that Jesus had chosen. So the Holy Spirit is speaking through Jesus, and the disciples are going to get commandments, things to do. So here's an example right away before, before they go out into what we call the Great Commission. Jesus is speaking to them through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving commandments to the disciples through Jesus. Verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to to the kingdom of God. So he's crucified. He died. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And then he's, now he's on the earth for 40 days. And what's he doing for 40 days? He's speaking. He's giving the disciples commandments through the Holy Spirit. And... He's speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now remember in Matthew chapter 3, we saw John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. He came out of the, in the wilderness. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's already at hand. Jesus says that later in chapter 4. He repeats that. And then he tells the disciples in chapter 10 before he sends them out to go out. He tells them where to go. And he says, preaching, repent for the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And then he tells them the part that we all like. To preach the gospel, cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead. The very first commandment part of that was to preach repentance. Unless somebody's convicted, they're not going to receive the rest of that. They have to repent of their sins infallible proofs that these proofs cannot be disputed so people see him alive and and later if you read through the book of acts you're going to see that they have to replace judas and they pick somebody they need to pick somebody who was with them from the very beginning at the baptism john the baptist when he baptized jesus until the end that's who becomes an apostle so that they can witness these things about Jesus they were there they were an eyewitness and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God verse 4 and being assembled together with them so they were together. Jesus is with them. He hasn't left yet. And they're still assembled. There is persecution happening all around them. And there will continue to be. But they still gather and they still assemble. We're going to see in a little bit that they do that with one accord or with one mind. In prayer. Which the definition of that word we saw before means worship supplication which is their petitions they're asking what they want and thanksgiving so they're in one mind and that that's that's this is why we're going to look at why that phrase came up six weeks ago because we have to see this in this chapter in these verses and then we can go and learn who this person of the Holy Spirit is and being assembled together with them he commanded them so we're in verse 4 in verse 2 he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments that's a plural he gave them commandments in verse 2 and in verse 4. Now he's giving them a command. He's commanding them to do something. So he tells them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for, and here it is, the promise with a capital P of the Father with a capital F. I'm, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. So the Holy Spirit, part of the Godhead, is is a promise from the father which he said and these are the words of Jesus you have heard from me so he's reminding them that he's told them you've heard this from me I'm the one telling you this he hasn't left yet and he's making sure that they get commanded to do certain things verse 5 for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we're very familiar with the term follow me when Jesus had the disciples follow him. Now they have to wait for a while. They're going to have to wait a few days, but he's commanded them to do this. Therefore, when they had come together, they, meaning the disciples, asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, this is fascinating because back, back in verse 2, he starts to give them commandments. And then in verse 3, he's with them for 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and they still haven't gotten the whole picture yet. They're talking about the kingdom of Israel. It hasn't, it hasn't been, it, they haven't gotten the revelation yet. So they ask him about restoring the kingdom to Israel. Now listen to what he says, how he answers them. And he said to them, this is Jesus, 
it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now, in the King James Version, which I usually use, that word authority says power. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, the, the, it's the Father that is going to put this. He's the only one that's going to know. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, everywhere. So they need the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. They need power to be able to witness. Peter does a pretty good job, I think, of submitting when he heals the guy at the beautiful gate beautiful. Now, he doesn't do it. He tells the Pharisees and the religious leaders later, why are you surprised? This isn't me. It wasn't a man that did this. It was God. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched... They're, they're eyewitnesses to this. He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So we have a little bit of a clue or a key about how he's going to come back right here in the book of Acts. That's important for us to know because <laughs> we are in the last days. We have to know who he is. We have to learn who God is, who Jesus is, because there's going to be People that come behind them that are antichrist, they have the antichrist spirit, and you have to make sure you know who you're, who you're following. You know, we mentioned that earlier tonight, that you can hear from the Father, you can hear from Jesus, or you can hear words spoken or guided by the Holy Spirit and then other spirits as well. So you have to discern, is this God? Is it something else or is it just me? Is it something that I want? The mind is a very powerful thing. And I've heard people say things to me that was their imagination. And they had someone else with them. And the more they got into this, the more they believed it. Now, if you tell yourself something and you believe that and you keep speaking that, you're going to believe it's the truth. You may, you may recognize in the beginning that it's a lie. You could even confess that, but the more that you speak it, there'll come a day when you're not sure whether, you know, was that real or was it me? Was that a dream or did I just speak about that? Paul writes about that. You have to cast down all imaginations. So verse 12. Then they return to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. So they're obeying the command that he gave them. Which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath, a Sabbath day's journey. So they, they obeyed him. They gathered, he, pro he told them, he gave them commandments, and, and then they obeyed them. They went and did something. So even before they perform miracles, we can see some of the acts, which we don't accredit them for, they're actually acting on Jesus' commands here. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew... Philip and Thomas, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew. Bartholomew is listed in one of the Gospels as Nathaniel. James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. So there's the 11 of them because Judas Iscariot is, all, is already dead. Now here's the verse 
where I saw this phrase that we got led to get into eventually the Holy Spirit, but we had to learn with what, one, what does this mean. Verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So that word prayer, the definition, the context that it's used in actually means worship. If you look at the prayer Jesus gave us that we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, it opens in praise or worship, and then you make your supplication or petitions, and it closes in praise again. So they're in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So there's other people there other than these people that the 11 that are going to become apostles so that gift is not just for pastors or ministers or evangelists or prophets if there if there is somebody truly in that office or or uh, somebody in an apostolic calling it's for everybody in the body of Christ it's one of God's over 7,000 promises God cannot lie. He's not a respecter of people. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120 and said. So he's, he's going to become the leader. He stands up. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled. Remember, God spoke through prophets of old. Jesus became the prophet in the New Testament following John the Baptist. John was a prophet. And now Peter is going to mention the Holy Spirit. So he stands up, and Jesus didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. These things are to be fulfilled. So here it is, one of the disciples... And he's speaking, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit, remember the Holy Spirit earlier in a verse spoke through Jesus' commandments, spoke before the mouth of David. David was a prophet. Concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. So there is a ministry. The gifts of the Spirit are for the ministry. That's what they're for. They're not for our personal use. And then Peter goes on to explain what happened to Judas, and they're going to draw lots for two people to fulfill the Scripture to, to fill that 12th slot for whatever reason Jesus wanted 12 apostles. So they're going to they're gonna pray. They ask God to examine the hearts. They actually say in the next few verses, Father, you know all of our hearts. And then that's when they ask God to show them. They don't pick them. They ask God to show them who this person is going to be. And like I said earlier, it's going to be somebody that was with Jesus at the baptism in the Jordan River when he was baptized all the way through up until he ascends. So that's who these people are. They're, they're going to be, they, there's another eyewitness to witness for Jesus. And then in chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, and we saw that meant the 50th day, they were all... With, they were all with one accord in one place. They weren't watching on live stream. They weren't in lockdown. They were all gathered by commandment of Jesus in one place, and they all were of one mind. That's where the body of Christ is heading to. There's goats and there's sheep. Jesus is weeding through them. We're being judged as the body right now. And these are the people 
that are going to be referred to as the ones that turned the world upside down. Now, why would somebody say that? Would it be somebody that just got up and, and, and handed someone a leaflet or a brochure? Or was it somebody that maybe was baptized in the Holy Spirit? They were guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit spoke through them. They spoke the, the, these words coming out of them. And then the Spirit moved on the truth. So we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Helper. So next week, we're going to start looking at what the different names of the Holy Spirit is. You may come up with more of them. I, I've got a list of 32 of them, uh, and we're going to start going through those along with what does that mean and the scriptures where they are. They're, they're, most of them are going to have multiple scriptures throughout the Bible uh, that show us these names of the Holy Spirit. And we'll end on that.